You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And all of this is to provide you with education and inspiration. So if you missed last week's episode, it was with Emily Campbell, the founder and executive producer of Gobella Events based in Colorado. And today's guest, who I'm so excited to announce, is Chioma Adure Wogu Johnson. Chioma is the creative director of Dure Events, a full-service wedding and event planning company based in Houston, Texas. Chioma has planned events across the United States and in a host of different countries, including St. Lucia, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Turks and Caicos, South Africa, Dubai, and Paris. They've been featured on platforms such as CNN, Monalucci Bridal Magazine, Ebony Magazine, Essence Magazine's Bridal Bliss, Isle Perfect, and more. So enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Chioma Adure Wogu Johnson. Chioma, it is so good to have you on the show. I know that you know A.B. Madison with Malik Photo Weddings, who is also on the podcast. And so thank you for taking your time today. I'm very, very excited to be speaking with you today, Andy. So I'm looking forward to an awesome interview and conversation with you. Well, yeah, Chioma. So, you know, one thing I would love to know, I mean, I, I read a lot about you, um, but I'm not sure uh, of your story in the beginning. Like, how did you first feel the passion for doing event design? How, how did that come about? Were you really young or was it later in your life? Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is, is that my dad is, a, is actually an artist. He actually sketches and draws very well. I come from a family of creatives and um, we're natural born entrepreneurs. And um, and even in, from my grandfather and my great grandparents, I had the privilege of meeting them. So our family uh, lineage are known to be strong leaders and also artists and also entrepreneurs as well. So um, I, I, re- I learned... Well, in, later on in life that my dad actually um, draws and sketches and designs as well. He's actually quite creative. He and my mother are. So, but my mom is a natural um, hostess. And, um, and my grandfather also had a very strong policy that before you, whenever you have a stranger walk into your compound, into your home, you don't ask them who they are first. You first feed your stranger, take care of the stranger, then you now ask them who they are. So I come from a family that's very big on hosting and taking care of um, anybody that comes our way, uh, we're very big on hospitality. But when it comes down to event planning and designing itself, um, I, it just happened to just fall on my lap. I did not uh, grow up anticipating that I was going to be an event planner. I actually wanted to, at first, I actually wanted to actually be on Broadway. Oh, really? As a singer and dancer? As a singer and dancer, yes. I actually wanted to be a Broadway dancer and a singer. And at the same time, too, with the entrepreneurial business mindset, I had a very strong passion in marketing and advertising and PR. So I was aiming more towards... Um, having my own marketing and advertising firm, while at the same time, I love skincare, I love fashion. I am being able to have my own skincare line, my own spa. So I had different plans of things I wanted to do, but event planning happened to now come on my lap where um, friends knew me then to be the hostess with the mostest. I will, you know, <laughs> transform my parents' living room. Just a little simple dinner, get together, a movie night will turn into, oh, let's make the cookie look pretty. Let's put a little bit of arrangements here and there. I was so big on etiquette because my mom was really big on etiquette. So I recall friends coming into the movie night and they will look, look at a really pretty stacked um, cookie and then will make fun of me and say, okay, Chi, uh, are we supposed to grab it this way so it won't fall or grab it this way? Because whenever you look something so pretty like this, you don't want to eat it because it just looks so pretty right. so, how do you grab it so it doesn't fall apart. So I will have to show my friends how to grab the cookie from here so that the pyramid or the square or the jigsaw puzzle or something like that does not fall apart. And, um, and simple long story short, an old friend of mine, um, was getting married and she asked me um, to come decorate um, her church. 
And I happened to, you know, go over there and I noticed that she was pretty stressed out. Uh, she had about 20 bridesmaids and they were very, very stressed out, plan, you know, getting in the wedding together. So I walk up to her and I asked her, hey, do you need help with anything? So she asked me, well, you're bossy. I need you to coordinate this wedding tomorrow. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, coordinate what wedding? I'm used to Nigerian weddings being very disorganized and <laughs> not being put together. It's always this auntie, that uncle, this person, that person. So all hands are involved, but it's just chaotic. And she was like, well, I need you to coordinate this wedding tomorrow. I said, I don't know anything about coordinating weddings. I didn't even know such things even existed. So I, super long story short, and I'm a really firm, you know, believer, uh, and you know, my my walk with God and believing in um, God just being a part of my journey. I went, you know, to my cousin's basement. I said a prayer to God. I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Please guide me through. And the next day, got there about about three hours beforehand. Went in front of the altar. I just took off. Please guide me because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. So all I all I remember in the back of my mind is that this is her wedding day. She's never gonna get this day back. And how would I want somebody else to treat me when it's my own turn when I get married? How would I want my day to feel like and to be like? So um, again, long story short short at that moment it just felt like you know like memories and visions that said were coming to my head like okay Chioma do this do that so I instantly became the moment where I was now guiding you know people I guess that was pretty much just helping her out and telling them what to do so I was able to coordinate a wedding of 350 people that was your first wedding 350 people 350 people wow invite only seated dinner I did that wedding by myself, and it was actually her husband that, at that time, took me to IHOP at 6 o'clock in the morning and as a thank you and told me, Chioma, I really think you should be a wedding planner. And I'm like, no, my, my goal is to be to be that black girl, a part of the black girl magic that breaks the glass ceiling that I said a woman can never do and could never accomplish. And uh, I already have a vision and he then found four wedding planners at that time in Texas. Um, that was years ago. Um, and reached out to them <laughs> and told them that, hey, there's this young girl, et cetera. Can you guys please give her a shot? She wants to see. They pretty much wanted me to try it and see if this is what I really, if I should be doing this. And that's how I ended up. Um, only one of them, uh, one of them at that time, she had the event house. Uh, she's my mentor. Uh, took me in and said, hey, Chi, I'm not going to give you all the resources because I'm still in the business, but I'm going to show you the ropes. I'm going to guide you through, ask me all questions. But loyalty is really important to her. Confidentiality was a big deal. And I made sure that while I was in her camp, I paid her the utmost respect by not engaging with her vendors. I did exactly what she wanted me to do and more. And so she gained um, my, I gained her trust or she gained my trust and vice versa. So she gave me my very first wedding out of trust to run myself. And at that time I charged $250. That's a steal. Wow. Uh, Yeah. And I didn't, I actually did not even have a business name. And by doing uh, my first, you know, um, it was a first 1,200 people wedding without a business name. We oh, got my featured. gosh. Yeah, we got featured in Ebony Magazine and without having a business name. And that's how my journey started. Um, and now here we are. Wow. <laughs> well, that, that's amazing, Chioma. So, you know, if you had to identify to someone who doesn't really know, you know, what your personal signature is with weddings, how, you know, how would you answer that? Our signature is quite personalized. I'm very big on um, having a more one-on-one conversation and interaction with my couple. And I address them as my couple because they are mine. I treat them like they are my family. I always get, also get engaged with the family members as well to like the parents and the uncles because I need them to feel, to understand that this, I'm, I have their back. I'm really big on having my couples and my clients back. So I answer my own call. I don't have assistants that answer my calls. I reply back to my own emails. I don't have assistants that reply back for me. Um, so I, I love that one-on-one and that personal touch. And that will allow me to sit down with a couple and say, allow me to get into your mind and get into your soul understand your core more because even if you're not able to verbally tell me Chi, this is what I want I need that opportunity to get to know you and I tell them it's a journey I'm not gonna you're not gonna give me all the answers right now so just 
If I'm asking you basic questions, I'm just opening up the door. But me getting to know you means that we are going to go through this journey together and I'm going to study you. I'm going to study what are your favorite foods, like what tickles your fancy when it comes to anything, everything visual. Um, How do you interact with your family? How do you interact with your friends? Even down to going shopping, sometimes I go as far as inviting some of my brides to my home for cooking classes and sessions. Oh, interesting. Huh. Because I love to cook because that's the way they get to know me and I get to know them. And from there, I can understand their core that even when they are not at a meeting, I am able to like say, this bride is not going to like that. This groom is not going to want that. This is what they're going to want. This is not what they're going to want. That when they're in a meeting, they don't even have to say much. Most times when my couple's coming to a meeting, they're like, why am I even here? Because she understands me like a book. So that's how I'm able to personalize their experience and their wedding by really truly allowing myself to be vulnerable with them and then also allowing them to be vulnerable with me so that way I can truly understand um, their core because I tell my couple all the time, your wedding is like you inviting somebody into your home for the first time when you're trying to host them. Imagine when they pull up in front of your house, how do you want your guests to feel when they come in front of your home? You have multiple options. Are you going to have a black car go pick them up or are you going to call them an Uber? That's an experience. Or when they arrive, if they drive themselves, are you going to have valet or they're going to park their own car? That's an experience. Or when they when they park their car, is there somebody that has champagne waiting for them when they get out of their car? Or when they get out, when their car is being valet, is there champagne being handed to them right before they walk into your door? I love that. That's great. Yeah, so when they walk into the door, you are met at the den. So the den is where you keep your guests. You kind of serve them some herbs and cocktail before you transition them into the dining area, which is now your ballroom. So how do you want that dinner to feel when they are sitting in the dining area? Because you're personalizing that experience. And then from that den to the dining, and then from dining to the parlor, which is where you're playing games or you're dancing, then the after party portion of it, or let's go to the backyard, let's grill. So you start a more formal direction you start going to the more semi-formal you're not going towards more casual and you end the night with a bang you know etc so how do you want your guests to feel if this was your home and that also helps them circle back and kind of like reduce and think about who would I want to invite to my wedding and if and if I can't invite you to my home and go through this process with you and spend this money catering to you, that person should not be in, in your wedding because that's the same thing that you're doing. So I take them through that psychological journey and also that social journey to understand how do you want your guests to feel, your family to feel when they walk into your quote unquote wedding home. Because that's how I put it. Yeah. So, Chiomi, you also, you know, earlier you mentioned about being vulnerable and, you know, yourself being vulnerable, the client being vulnerable. This reminds me, um, there was an interview I heard of yours or I read of yours with Voyage Houston where you said, uh, quote, I learned early on that my role as an event planner also meant that I became a sort of therapist for my clients. That has often been a burden to bear, especially as you end up ignoring yourself and your needs. Finding that balance has been my greatest struggle, I think. It's hard when you love your clients and love what you do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <Love> Andy. <laughs> yeah. That, why are you laughing so much? No, I'm laughing because I am. Um, it's, it's great to hear that being read back to you, you know? And then that is a part of therapy because interesting, this month, it's interesting like how much the business, as much as it is fulfilling, it also takes a lot away from you too. It does. Yeah, it's tough. And that's an area, unfortunately, in the industry that's not being talked about is the mental health of the industry. And I and and I had a very interesting conversation with someone the other day. As much as couples and clients are, are loading things on you, they're loading their financial issues, they're loading their family issues, they're loading their personal issues. And your job and my job, like I I tell people all the time, I'm not your standard wedding planner. I am a vision strategist. I am a creative director. And because I walk you through that journey and that process, because my job is to be able to be vulnerable enough to be able to receive what you're bringing to me. And I also have to be firm and strong enough mentally to be able to process what you're dishing out to me and then being able to help to remove myself from that situation and being able to guide you through it. But then what happens after their problems are solved? How does trauma go back and 
regain back herself again. How do I, what do I do? What do I do to de-stress? What do I do to detox and being able to like get back to my normal self? What do you do in order to kind of ground yourself and bring yourself back? You know, what are some of your techniques? Cook. I cook. Uh, Cooking is a form of distress for me because when I'm cooking, I typically, when I'm by myself in the kitchen, I don't talk to anyone. Um, it's just myself. I'm focused on that cooking. I'm focused on the ingredients. I'm focused on the flavor. And I'm focused on things like I want to try to make that food taste better every time. And so it helps me get everything, put everything in the back burner and just focus on something I enjoy. I love to go to the spa. I am a skincare and wellness freak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I do spend time going to the spa by myself and um, being able to kind of disengage. And um, and I also, believe it or not, whenever I travel to do weddings, because I would travel a lot hosting weddings and events, I make sure that whatever hotel that myself and my team are staying at, it needs to be at least about four or five star. Reason being that I want to be able to make that space my home. I want to be able to make that feel like my century. So I do splurge a little on that luxury of being able to stay at a very comfortable hotel room or suite to kind of help me feel like I'm in a new and a different space. And last but not least, I um, I have, um, there's only very, very close, um, like my family, my mother is, um, she's just a rock and so is my dad and my siblings. So um, they allow me to be able to de-stress because it's not a lot of people that Everybody looks at you that, oh, she's strong. She's doing this and doing that. But not everybody truly means it when they call you to ask you, how are you doing? So I've learned to be able to differentiate between the real, how are you doing? Or how are you doing? But let me get something (laughs) from you. Right. (laughs) I want to be sure you know the wonderful news of our latest show, Stop and Smell the Roses, with acclaimed lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Not only will he share the secrets, tools, and technologies behind his extraordinary ability to create a theatrical environment out of any space, you will also discover more about the man behind the magic. Preston will reveal how his focus on personal growth has been the root of his professional success, and you'll have the opportunity for him to answer your questions along the way. Plus, Preston will be inviting onto the show many of the star celebrities he has worked with in the past, so you don't want to miss a single episode. We also have another great show on the Wedding Biz Network, The Business of Being Creative, with host Sean Lowe. Since debuting, his show has really taken off, and he's continuing to bring you the creative business advice he's shared with accomplished industry notables. Be sure to take advantage of Sean's talkback opportunity by recording questions and comments from right there in each episode's show notes. So, if you are a creative who is turning your craft into a business or want to take it to another level, head to theweddingbiznetwork.com and take a listen to Stop and Smell the Roses with Preston Bailey and The Business of Being Creative with Sean Lowe. That's theweddingbiznetwork.com. Just go back for a moment. I mean, you're, you're also talking about taking care of your team. You know, you mentioned when you're staying, you know, at a hotel, you want it to be really nice. You want to take care of yourself and your team. What about the business aspect? Like, obviously, you're very successful and it's more than just the creativity, right? It's also you're running a business. How do you feel about balancing the business with the art, with the, you know, of what you do? To be very honest with you, Andy, it is quite hard. Um, Considering the fact that being, number one, being a woman and then being a Black woman and an African woman in the industry and it feels a lot of times that you're alone, even though you have a team, you have a core, but a lot of times it feels like you're going through the journey yourself. So it, it, it just trying to balance the business aspect of it and the creative aspect of it is hard because the business aspect of it forces me to be selfish. And selfishness is an area in my part that I struggle with. And I'm just being 100% transparent. And... um. So it's an area that I struggle with of looking at assisting myself. So I had to not get to the point where like, okay, I need to train my team the same way that I look out for my clients. I need to train a team that can also look out for me too. Right. That's a really good point. How many team members do you have? Like how many full-time people do you have versus contractors? 
there's full time seven of us, seven full time. Wow. Then yeah, and then day of, and then of course the total team we have a total of twelve. I see. And, and and how many of them are actual planners who also are planning events with you under your umbrella? So we have one junior planner. Her name is OZ. And then we have two leads. Um, we have two leads. We have oh, just two or three leads. We have Karen, Toy, and we also have Monica. So we have three leads and then we have one junior planner and then myself as the as a head junior, as a as a head planner. Sorry. I also know that you're doing a lot of other types of events as well, trunk shows and incentive programs. And in terms of just weddings, how many weddings are you doing a year? Oh, dear God. Uh, prior to COVID, we were around about 18 to 22. Okay. Before COVID, we were doing almost 25 to about 28 weddings, but I made a decision to reduce that. So my goal pre-COVID in 2020 and 2021 for me, was for me to do maximum between 12 to 13 weddings per year. And why is that? Why is that? I wanted to spend more time with my couples, my clients, and um, and be able to like really, really perfect because I feel like there's always room to grow. Um, every single event for me is always a training ground um, and it's always an opportunity to grow. So I always feel like the more I get better at something, the more I find something else to improve in. So, and I felt like for me to be able to identify the areas I need to improve in, I need to make out time. And I wanted to make sure that my couple are able to have as much time of myself as much as they can. So that way I'm able to really even put more effort towards their wedding. However, COVID had made it really difficult because the weddings that were not had that could not happen in 2020 now pop on top of the weddings in 2021. That's right. 2021 weddings did not want to postpone their wedding because to them, as far as they're concerned, it's not their fault that. COVID happened. So we were not stuck with doing over 33 events. Oh my gosh. Okay. This year. Yes. So we had to produce, but next year, Andy, I am not. (laughs) (laughs) Best believe (laughs) I'm not doing that nonsense (laughs) that happened this year. No, next year it is going to be a hundred percent going back to the original plan of keeping it between 13. the most cap 15 weddings, but my idea is to keep it cap it at 12. And what about your pricing philosophy? Like, I know that some people will charge a percentage, other people will charge a flat fee, other people do a combination. Just generally speaking, what is your philosophy about that? Well, my philosophy about pricing is this, especially me doing multicultural weddings. Um, unfortunately, um, they were specializing in Nigerian weddings and African weddings per se. The wedding planning sector, as much as we are the most, believe it or not, the most valuable and the most hardworking, the most stressed, but the wedding planners are also the least appreciated. And um, because a lot of questions are asked, well, why am I paying a wedding planner, a Nigerian wedding planner that? Why am I paying this? So for me, I figured if I did this percentage, it was very easy for the couple to potentially come back and say, oh, well, due to some financial restraining issues or whatever, we're going to have to cut back on our budget. I know you're charging 15, 20%, but I know we told you $200,000 or $150,000, but we're going to have to go cut it down to $50,000. And then now I'm stuck in a contract. So, and then now I have to now be stuck by charging a particular fee. So it puts me in a very emotional um, and, a, and a very unfair space and state. And having packages never worked out for me because if I did full planning, partial planning, day of coordination, I end up, myself and my team, we are so involved in every aspect of the wedding that we end up finding ourselves getting even more involved than what we're being paid for. So I completely nixed the whole idea of having packages is that I just have a flat fee for up to a certain number of guests. I see. Yeah. So it just helped me a lot more to just say, okay, this is our fee. For this number of guests, but if you want to do events and you want a much more cost-effective option, we have junior planners that for their fee is right about what 30, 40% off of what I typically charge. You know, I also wanted to ask you about social media and marketing strategy because I know I know Chioma that you uh, have a, a really large following on Instagram. I think you're up to around sixty thousand followers. But more than that, your engagement is really high. Like I, I'm seeing that it's not unusual to get nineteen hundred likes. I mean, it's just it's it's amazing. 
eight, here's one that gets eight, got 8,000. I mean, what can you say about your social media and how you've been able to develop that? Uh, it comes right along with the core uh, as well to keeping things personalized, keeping things more organic, just pretty much just being yourself. I didn't want to have the Instagram page that was more standard. Oh, I'm just going to put pictures and da, 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 and without it having a heart and a soul. And um, so I, I really believe in, you know, not, and also breaking the rule. The rule, people always say, oh, you do step one, step two, step two, step five. But the beauty about branding and also sometimes the curse about branding is, to me, branding is like a fingerprint. You can't work, may work for somebody, most likely will not work for you. So you have to be able to understand what is branding and then also understand what is your fingerprint in branding. Well, what does is, what is branding mean to you? Branding means, to me, branding is just simply just, to for me, being yourself enough to whereby you are able to tell your own story and have your own narrative and being able to sell yourself and getting people to understand who you are and go right along with who you are and what you are. So how do I package myself to where I become valuable to not just to myself, but to you? And that's my, my fingerprint is Chioma. My fingerprint is how it is that I'm going to be on social media, whatever, 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 whether I'm advertising or whatever, who is she, what is she? And then that's what reflects back on my social media. Like for instance, my mom, I had an interesting chat with my mom the other day because I'm not a, I'm not a drinker. I can't hold alcohol for nothing. Um, <laughs> so I had one of my previous couple, Charlie and Stanley, that invited me to a uh, dinner with their family. And I decided to engage in some drink and one or two champagne took me out. And, um, <laughs> and, was, uh, and that's how much of a lightweight that I, I am. And uh, we took a shot. They told me, Chief, take a shot. Come on, you never get to loosen up. So I took a shot. <laughs> and the next day I was like, oh, my God, this is not for me. But guess what? I put up something on Instagram and in my broken English, I said, who sent me? Who sent me to go out and drink alcohol when I know I can't handle it? <laughs> you, 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 yeah, that's funny. You should never get on social media when you're drinking. <laughs> exactly. So I said, and I put up something on social media after I like, got, you know, so sobered up yeah. to say that um, who sent me, in other words, this life is not for me. So next time, just give me water, put some lemons in it, or give me mocktail. Happy Saturday, everybody. But you know, the beauty part of it is that people found it funny. People were cracking up. They were like, oh, so Chi, you're not a prude. You're actually a work. So you actually can have fun. You yeah. can actually have a personality. So I, and that quirky side of me. So I had to explain to my mom. My mom was like, I think that's what you were doing. I was like, yeah, but that's just, it's not all part of me that I show on social media. But being able to have a personality is not, everything is not about, me posting about the couple, the wedding. Sometimes I post, if I find a funny meme or I find a hilarious video or like a, that things that, that we call, like in Nigeria, we say ginger me. Things that get me all excited and gingered and et cetera. I will post it on my paper because if I find it funny, somebody else, it will make somebody else's day. Come on, enjoy and laugh about it. And let's just be, let's just have fun while at the same time we're being, okay, here's the work, here's the seriousness, here's the behind the scenes of what we're doing. And let's keep it organic and keep it engaged. So my social media and my brand is me. Right. I also know that you speak a lot, you know, in, in various places. What What are some of the topics, the main topics that you talk about? Oh, I get asked questions a lot about budgeting and planning Nigerian weddings, handling Nigerian weddings and the stress. Um, destination weddings because I do a lot of destination weddings as well too. Yeah, those <laughs> those are the questions. Typically, the things that I talk about are multicultural weddings and budgeting, and pretty much how to be able to sell and convince, sell your brand and your business to a multicultural circle, especially when it comes to Nigerian weddings. Well, let's talk about, I mean, just for a moment, multicultural weddings. I mean, that really is a challenge. You know, my knowledge of it, I'm in the, I am on the music side, and so I don't. I don't have to deal with it as directly as you do, but um, more and more in today's world, um, it is multicultural. I mean, that's that's really, I, I don't know if we want to call it a trend. I think it's been happening for a while and I think it's going to continue to grow. How do you look at that? I mean, I, I can't imagine what, what you must have to go through to learn about the needs of each side of the family when it's when it's multicultural like that. 
Well, I, I really, really do give um, thanks to my parents and my family and also my culture too, because um, our culture and our tradition and everything that has to be family is embedded in us, in my blood. So growing up, we are taught that everything is about family. Everything is about respect. Everything is about celebration. Everything is about working hard. Everything is about involving other people. So we were taught there's always family meetings. We come from a culture that believes in family meetings, whether it's virtual or in person. We come from a culture that believes in disparate people have to be involved in planning this event. It's important that you get the blessing of this person before you can move forward in doing this. So it made it a lot easier because I'm, I already grew up in that dynamics. So it makes it a lot easier for me to be able to go to mommy or daddy that might be... Um, that maybe let's say the, the groom is Yoruba and then the bride is Igbo or Edo or whatever culture that church culture that may, they may come from. But it's easy for me to be able to go to this family and say, hey, mommy, daddy, here's what's going on with the wedding. Let's have a meeting. Uh, can I follow up with this or can you follow up with that? And also go to this family and say, OK, what are your needs and your expectations? OK, how about this? Why don't we all sit together and have a family meeting? Um, so that way all the needs are all put on the table. Everybody has expressed their what they're particular about and what they're not particular about. And that way they can also get to understand this is where I come in. Because the biggest mistake anybody can ever do planning cultural weddings is to come off uneducated, not experienced, and coming off weak. The moment they sense that weakness in you or sense that you don't know what you're doing at that moment they have taken over the wedding and forgetting you don't know you will no longer exist or be valued for anything until after the wedding is over so it's important while you're paying respect and giving everybody the respect that's due to them and hearing them out it is also important too that you also establish a very firm ground to be able to let the parents and the family know i know this is your wedding but this is my event. But here's how we're going to do this. We want to make sure that you are not embarrassed at the end of the day. So to make sure that everything runs smoothly, mommy, daddy, this is what we're going to do. Well, Chairman, I want one, two, three, four, and five. Well, mommy, I completely understand where you're coming from, but respectfully speaking, the answer will be no. However, here's a better option. Like, it's not a good idea to tell a Nigerian family, African parents and say, no, you can't have this. Immediately, you become the enemy. You can't say, oh, no, 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 without a solution. Say a no respectfully, but at the same time, here is a better solution that will even make people talk about you more, make getting more excited, that will make it peaceful, that will make it clean, that will make it to whereby it's not disorganized. Always have a solution for the parents with coupled with your no, followed by your no. Yeah, you know, I like to do that in all situations, whether it's personal or business, right? If I'm going to say, well, that's that's an issue, that's a problem, or that I can't do that, I always want to have a solution at the same time. Even if someone wants to get together and I'm not able to get together when they want, I want to come back and say, well, I can't do that, but how about, you know, like I, I agree with that. I think always having some kind of a solution. Also, you know, I'm just thinking about in addition to multicultural and how that certainly is growing and growing and growing for all of us, the rate of change in general, whether it's technology or just all other non-technological issues is so huge, right? In On the planet, in the world, certainly it's reflected in events and weddings. How do you deal with this constant rate of change and also staying relevant? Geoma, like, you know, as an event planner, as an event designer in this changing world where there's so much, um, you know, it's, it's such there's like no barrier to entry. All these people come in and think they can do it. How do you stay relevant? <laughs> well, um, stay relevant is, um, again, allowing yourself to be able to um, be put in a very hard situation so that you can be able to know how to rise above it. In other words, doing things that other people are not doing, um, allowing yourself to educate more, like educating yourself and being a part of things by the moment I sense, the moment I feel like, okay, something here is different. I'm instantly going in and educating myself and asking a lot of questions and preparing my team. I'm having to be, okay, hey, you guys, we experienced something different today. How do we make sure that we are better at this at the next event? How do we make sure that what are the resources? If I cannot find that resource, Andy, we create it. Right. I like that. I love that. Yeah. If I cannot find that resource, we better be ready to make it. Because to me, if I can envision it, 
it better be happening. So if it means me hiring a coder, if it means me getting um hiring a management company or doing this or you know, pretty much outsourcing things to be able to like educate at, at the same time, I'm also educating myself on how to code. I'm educating myself on how to be able to maneuver um certain design processes that things that normally I'm not supposed to do. I'm educating myself on how to write scripts. If I have to write a script about for something for a pastor or whatever child might but I know how to do that. And there's so many things that I also go as far as educating myself just in case I am put in a position where I have to execute. So there should not be any excuse whatsoever. And then, so those are the kind of things when people have interviews with me and they see the level of knowledge and also see the kind of system and the flow that we utilize for planning weddings, it does help set us apart from um, other companies because I, I'm very big on, okay, what can we do better? What, how can we better improve this process? And then last but not least, accountability. Um, it's really important that when um, your clients and vendors are able to see, they're able to own up to their mistakes. They're able to say that we made, we dropped the ball on this. Accountability, but accepting that accountability that also allows us room to learn and make sure that we are providing we know we made a mistake on this, but here are ways that we are working on improving this. Here's something that we are trying to make sure that this does not happen again. So, yeah, those are pretty much ways that we make sure educating ourselves and taking full accountability and then also learning from those mistakes and those accountabilities them, and definitely not allowing ourselves to be able to live in guilt, um, but learning from it and definitely moving on and moving past it. Yeah, I love that. And, and, you know, I have one more question and I, you know, in a sense, you just answered a good piece of it. But but still, if you were, let's say you were mentoring someone, someone who has been in the business maybe a couple of years, wants to get to the level that you're at, what would you say is is either one or two of the biggest pieces of tips and advice that you would give someone younger who's trying to come up in the business at this time? Humility and accountability. Humility allows you to. There's a proverb um, in, in my country that says, what a child sees standing, an adult sees it better sitting down. And meaning that the elder know better than you do because they've gone through that. So just because you are standing does not mean that you are greater than the person sitting down. In other words, humility. Bring yourself down and ask questions. Bring yourself down and be ready to receive those criticisms, those praises. Do not let the praises get to your head because the, praise, the same people that are praising you today are the same people that are going to talk and tear you down the next day. So you cannot rely on people's acknowledgement and praises because it wavers. So that's why confidence is extremely important. And then what also helps your confidence too is accountability, being able to own up to your mistakes and being able to say that I made this mistake, how can I do better and not allow myself to live in guilt that will prevent me from growing. So humility and accountability definitely helps a lot for the person to have their minds opened up, to be ready to receive to learn and to receive and then be able to now grow. But at the same time, being able to now understand the level of confidence that is not cockiness, but the level of confidence that when you're being praised, it will not get to your head, but you're also confident enough to understand your value. Yeah, great advice. Well, wow, the time has flown here. This is <laughs> this has been wonderful, Chioma. I really appreciate you taking the time for this. I, I really respect what you do, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Chioma Adure Wogu Johnson. Be sure to check out her website, and that is Dure Events, spelled D U R E E V E N T S. Her social media handles on Facebook and Instagram is Dure Events. And be sure to check out the show notes at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And if you can think of three good friends who you feel would benefit from this conversation, please share it with them. And I want to announce next week's guest, and that is going to be Emily Rifle, Senior Social Sales Manager of the iconic venue, The Plaza in New York City. We'll catch you next week on The Wedding Biz. Wedding Biz.